an international government affairs manager with Chevron, and also a member of the board of directors of the World Affairs Council of America. Chevron is very pleased to be a sponsor of the conference over the next couple of days because we share your interest in addressing some of the, the critical challenges that we face both here at home in the U.S. as well as globally. Therefore, I'm particularly proud to be able to introduce our next panel that's focusing on the role of U.S. energy policy in the panel titled Confronting a Challenge in the Future. At Chevron, we recognize that affordable, reliable energy is really the foundation for economic growth and prosperity. And in order to produce that affordable, reliable energy, we rely on having sound, effective energy policy. Fortunately, we've got four experts in that area to discuss the subject this afternoon. Jason has agreed to continue to moderate. And as the founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center, he's well placed to do that. Just as the World Affairs Councils, as you all, have identified energy as a key focus area uh, for 2012 and beyond, BPC similarly has a number of initiatives looking at energy issues. He's joined by Jim Burkhardt, the Managing Director of IHS Sierra's Global Oil Group. And for those of you who don't know IHS Sierra, they're one of the leading resources, a fundamental resource for the critical knowledge and the independent analysis that's got to inform energy policy. Also joining us is James Marston, head of the Texas Office of the Environmental Defense Fund, as well as the director for their National Energy Program. EDF is a leading voice on energy policy issues, and it works to play an active role working not only with environmentalists in the NGO community, but also with, energy, with industry to help inform policy decisions. And then, Senator Byron Dorgan. Senator Dorgan has long been a champion of an effective, balanced energy policy. And I was just saying to him as he walked on the stage, we really miss him up on the hill for that role. And in fact, I don't think you're going to see um, a, a better example of effective energy policy than in his home state of North Dakota and the economic revival that they're experiencing because of that. Uh, among the multiple hats he wears today, he's also leading some of the energy initiatives at the Bipartisan Policy Center. So gentlemen, thank you for your participation this afternoon and look forward to the discussion. All right, well, as your grand inquisitor, I'm happy to be back. Um, so just to set the stage, uh, so let's talk out there in general and maybe uh, in particular when it comes to energy policy, just to kind of set up the first broad question. You know, my perception is that when the president came into office, there was really a desire to have, have a new consensus that would create a kind of bipartisan basis for energy policy. And there were four components. There was the stimulus, which would uh, provide investment in new technology, which would always have a bipartisan basis. There was the idea of a market-based approach to regulating greenhouse gases, which both the president and Senator McCain had supported. There was the notion of increasing domestic oil production, principally on the OCS and increasing domestic nuclear production. Those four ideas were kind of the four pillars of what was supposed to be a new bipartisan consensus. So you can walk through those quickly in your mind. Stimulus, not so bipartisan. Climate change legislation, one of the um, most unfortunately kind of caustic debacles in recent legislative history. The condo, Fukushima. We're kind of over for four. And so there's basically somewhat of a wasteland right now in energy policy. And I want to now, as an optimist, go down the line and ask each of our panelists, you know, what do you see as the themes that, in fact, could revive a more meaningful debate that could ultimately produce good energy legislation? So. Well, uh, two years ago in June, we passed a bill out of the Senate Energy Committee that did all kinds of interesting, wonderful things that, that finally began to define what our policy might be looking forward. 
Um, it was it was passed on a bipartisan vote, which is very unusual in recent times, and never got to the floor of the Senate. Bipartisan, comprehensive energy legislation uh, that would have allowed more oil and natural gas, uh, would have uh, uh, the first ever renewable electricity standard, uh, high voltage interstate transmission capability to move energy from where the sun shines and the wind blows to the load centers where it's needed, all of those things. It was blocked from coming to the floor of the Senate by those who insisted that climate change bill be developed on the floor first. They never had 60 votes for that, so uh, the fact is it blocked anything else that was meaningful. And the very menus that, that, that you would want to address climate change were in the energy bill that passed on a bipartisan basis. And I've spoken to those who blocked it more recently, and they ruined the day that they made that decision. So we're now in, in, a, in a circumstance, uh, Jason, where we don't really have a comprehensive energy policy going forward. If you're a, if you are a wind developer, you don't have the foggiest idea whether the production tax credit may or may not be extended. You just don't have any idea. Um, if, if you uh, are wondering about additional oil and gas production, perhaps the Eastern Gulf or the Destin Dome for natural gas, you don't have any idea when that might happen. Uh, and you can just go right on down the list. We may, we may have a couple of nuclear energy plants, uh, um, you know, thanks to uh, Senator Domenici who put in place a lot of uh, those pieces and, and the uh, loan guarantees and so on. But what we really need to have happen is to understand where a new intersection this intersection requires energy policy, it requires environmental policy that goes hand in hand, and, and we need to set the rules so that this country can move forward and, and you can count on, invest in, and believe in where this country is headed. We don't have that in virtually ener any energy source. If I may make one more point, we've got disruptive positive news in natural gas. There are consequences with it, but it's an abundant source of natural gas. And in North Dakota, we're producing an enormous amount of oil, which I'd love to tell you about. Uh, you know, the highest assessed amount of recoverable oil ever assessed by the U.S. Geological Survey in the history of the lower 48 states. We've got 200 uh, drilling rigs drilling one well a month. That's about 2,000, 2,500 wells a year. And they're going to drill 25 to 30,000 wells and we're producing a lot of oil. Jim, what do you see as something that could start to be tool to the One uh, part that I'd like to focus on, I'll lead off on, on North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota today produces about as much oil as Ecuador. Ecuador is a member of OPEC. I don't think like North Dakota is at risk of joining OPEC, but that just gives you a sense of the scale of what's happened in North Dakota. That's been replicated throughout many parts of the United States. Uh, Doug Foshi earlier talked about the the shale gale, the revolutionary increase in gas production. You mentioned oil, but just a couple numbers to really give you a sense of uh, what's happening in the oil space. Over the last two years, from 2008 to 2010, guess what country recorded the largest increase in oil production? It's the United States by far. And that reversed 38 years of nearly continuous decline. The U.S. increased its oil, technically liquids, production by about 1.2 million barrels per day over the last two years. The number two country was Russia, which increased its production by about 400,000 barrels per day. So that gives you a sense of what's happening in what we call this, this great revival. It has nothing to do with religion. Uh, they're from the South. Uh, Maybe a religious experience for some folks, but we're seeing this great revival onshore. Uh, production in, in the U.S. and when you combine this great revival on the oil side with what you heard about earlier with the gas shale gale, the revolution in gas production, it means that like them or not, like them or not, oil and gas are going to remain uh, very competitive for uh, many years, many decades into the future. And what we're seeing in the U.S will translate over time to developments in other parts of the world. Jason, you mentioned Poland as a shale gas uh, player. There's many others as well. So love it or hate it, the, this rejuvenation of oil and gas production in the U.S. will be will take place around the world and make them competitive for many decades to come. Great. Do you have any uh, thoughts on an equation that could motivate a more constructive uh, energy policy discussion? Yeah. I'll start with the idea that 
the, the, the political climate we're in makes it hard to pass anything. So you have to get ideas that, number one, don't require government money. We're in an era of government sca uh, funding scarcity. Number two, can go forward a lot without the federal legislation. States can do things for private industry. And then, then the idea is the federal government come along and help a little bit. Because so I think that's all we're going to get right now. So the three, th three areas where I think that, that makes a difference. One is natural gas. And natural gas has great potential, uh, both to, to clear our skies over our cities, but also to make a difference in greenhouse gas uh, emissions. If, if done correctly, uh, yes, it's clearly cleaner as a water fuel, but a lot of new evidence about the amount of fugitive emissions have come out about natural gas. Uh, methane is 23 to 30 times more potent per molecule than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. A little bit of leaking dramatically reduces the greenhouse gas benefits of natural gas. We've got to get a handle on that. But I think states and federal government can do that. And frankly, industry ought to do it because they're wasting product. And I think some of the progressive companies understand that it's a, big, a bigger number than they thought it was. Uh, number two is what we call clean technology that's enabled by smart grid. Um, we're going to spend $2 trillion upgrading the electric system in this country. The question is, do we recreate the system of the 1990s? Or do we create a system that takes advantage of this amazing new technology in terms of telecommunications and computers and sensors and demand response opportunities to get us a very clean system that actually will cost us less? Um, the system is going to get better. The question is, it's going to be a little better, a little smarter, or it's going to be really smart and a lot cleaner. The third area is we've got to figure out how to take advantage of the $20 bills that are lying on the ground that McKinsey is, and other companies have, have identified in the area of energy efficiency. Uh, there was McKinsey and company said that we can get 60% of the way toward our 2030 goals under the, the federal legislation on climate change with existing technology and a net savings. Most of that's energy efficiency. We're basically wasting a lot of money. Now, in comparison to Japan, Europe, um, lots of other countries are more efficient. We've got a problem in the, that we're not investing there. And the main problem is old, old uh, market barriers. Split the cities, lack of capital, lack of information. We've got to figure out how to get billions of dollars of private money into this investment opportunity to, to make a big difference. And that requires some tweak in policy, um, some additional information, and a way to let the bankers and the financial community have different types of um, financing for upgrading existing buildings. Thanks, Jim. That's a nice trilogy. So I'm going to pose one more general and possible question uh, for the three of you, and we can get a little more specific. Energy security has really been an idea that has motivated most of the national politics around energy for many, many years. And it means something different to everybody. So I was going to ask each of you, um, if you can, to give me your sense of, if not the definition of energy security, what's an important facet of energy security? And do you have any thoughts about a policy initiative that should be taken to move us in that direction? Well, I think most people, when they talk about energy security, think in terms of the quantity of oil that we import, because our, this economic engine of ours uh, runs on oil, among other things. But we would not, uh, we would not have an engine that's running this morning or this afternoon if, uh, just like that, the amount of oil that we import into this country were not available to us. So. That becomes an energy security and a national security issue. That's why organizations like Secure America's Future Energy, the SAFE organization, which I've worked with, and, and many others are involved in, in that issue. Uh, we, we will never be completely independent, nor should we aspire to be independent. Uh, you know, I mean, oil from Canada, for example, is, is not the same as oil from uh, uh, Venezuela, right, in terms of, in terms of national security. But um, 
uh, let me mention one other point I'd like to because when uh, when you mentioned North Dakota, I read the other day some claim that we in North Dakota have been unbelievably bright and resourceful and therefore had an economy that was booming with almost no unemployment and good for us because of our, and if we could just bring this great judgment to the national level, we'd solve all of America's ills. Uh, and of course, that, that does not make sense. Uh, I, I described our circumstances in North Dakota the way J. Paul Getty described to a young student the recipe for success. Get the best education you can, study hard, do well, go find the best job you can find, excel, do well, then strike oil. And that's, that's what happened to those of us in North Dakota. Uh, but I think of national security more, and energy security more in the context of uh, the dependence we have on foreign oil, although that dependence has come down some from the mid-60s or the low 60s, now just under 50%. Yeah, I, I totally agree. When we, we talk about energy security, if we set aside the environmental issues, those are very important. If we set those aside and look at the, the energy security equation, it is all about oil. Uh, the U.S. Uh, produces about 80% of the total energy it consumes. Almost all the imported energy is oil uh, from overseas, some, some from Canada. So just from the perspective of energy security, we have entered an era where uh, if we define energy security as continentally uh, produced oil, oil that doesn't have to go long distances on a tanker, not through uh, uh, the Persian Gulf, isn't dependent on countries that may not have our interests uh, at stake. If you look at oil produced in the US and Canada, the Canadian oil sands, controversial, no doubt, have been a major source of supply growth. They've enhanced the continental oil security over the last decade. If you look at what could happen in terms of production in the U.S. and Canada, North American oil security, and the U.S. and Canada are linked. It's like one market for oil and gas. They're, they're linked by pipelines, by trade. There's the potential to have a significant increase in energy security over the next 10 years through more oil production in Canada and the United States. Keystone pipe, Keystone XL pipeline, I'm sure some of you are probably aware of it. That would be an important signal. That's a proposed pipeline to ship more oil from Alberta down to the U.S. Gulf Coast. President Obama is going to decide on that, whether to approve that or not uh, shortly. Uh, that would be a key litmus test, a key test that will, key indicator, let's say, a key indicator about whether the United States wants more oil from Canada or not, and that will be an important signal whether oil security will be enhanced by more uh, continental uh, production. Just looking at it from the perspective of energy security and not necessarily the environmental question, that's a different issue, although they are. Share the imported oil definition? Well, what I'd say is security means more than having the product produced here or in North America. Um, the Pentagon did a very interesting and frankly frightening study about the security implications of climate change. And he predicted uh, growing wars over things like water uh, and other resources. And the climate change could make us a lot less secure than we even are now. So if you're going to really talk about energy security, you have to have a policy that is long term, that takes care of not only the geopolitics of today, but the geopolitics that my 23 year old daughter is going to be facing over her, her lifetime. And I think if we don't think long term and understand the consequences of investing billions of dollars in infrastructure that, that locks us into old dirty energy, we're going to go we'll rue the day because we, we missed the, the chance for a, a true, a secure future. Question for Jim Burkhart. Um, uh, this is Sister. Why is oil so damn expensive? Because we are in a global recession. Demand is down. Spare capacity is up. We're producing more oil than we need. What's going on? 
Why is it so expensive? Well, it's a global market, so although demand in the U.S. and Europe has been flat as declining, in fact, we think U.S. oil demand peaked in 2005 and will not exceed that level again. It is a global market, which means demand is rising because of China, India, growth in other emerging markets, which I'm sure you're all very uh, familiar with. That's part of it. Uh, the other part is over the last decade, the probably the second biggest story in energy, or at least in oil and gas, was the dramatic increase in the cost of finding and developing oil. Part of that had to do with the lost generation. When the oil price collapsed in 1986, the number of students going into petroleum engineering fields plummeted dramatically. And then when oil prices rose during the past decade, there was sudden demand to develop more fields. And you don't just create an experienced petroleum engineer overnight. Uh, if you ask uh, uh, somebody from you know, the CEO of Schlumberger, how long will it take to get a, somebody with 15 years, and how long will it take to find a trained uh, uh, engineer with 15 years experience from China or India, and they'll say 15 years. So that's another, you know, this, that cost was one factor that helped to elevate the, uh, the factor that's behind the high oil prices. Uh, but if you want to cut right to the chase, if you look at um, the marginal barrel, there's, there's some oil that's cheap to produce, $10, 20 There's other oil that is very expensive to produce. The oil sands in Canada are in the range of the more expensive barrels to produce. You need about $70, $80, even $90 a barrel to justify new investment. Uh, in the oil sand. So the marginal cost of oil is simply a lot higher than it is in natural gas. Remember, natural gas is a continental market. It's not a global market, so the pressures on it are different. Let me just mention that I think there's also excessive speculation in these markets. Jim will remember a meeting we had, uh, the famous meeting that's been written about uh, a couple of books, uh, one of which I wrote. Uh, in the U.S. Senate, we had a meeting on this issue of excess speculation in energy markets. And it got to be a pretty heated meeting. Uh, I think what has happened over uh, the last decade, or, or slightly more than that, the development of commodity index funds, the way they're traded, uh, an unbelievable amount of additional speculation in these marketplaces has perverted the marketplace. Supply and demand doesn't always tell us what the price will be. Uh, we've seen the price of oil go to $147 a barrel in day trading. There was no, no excuse for that to happen. There was nothing in supply and demand that justified it. Uh, and so we see these movements these days with some of these commodities that, uh, in my judgment, because of excess speculation in marketplaces, uh, defy what you would expect the market to price the commodity. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission is supposed to be the one that's between the consumer and those that engage in these practices, but they've been fairly toothless until recently. Now the chairman has grown some, some fearsome teeth and he doesn't have enough members to, uh, uh, with him on the CFTC to do all that I think he should do. But uh, it, when, when the commodity markets were created, the futures trading was created um, in the 1930s, there's a specific provision in law that deals with excess speculation because they were, there was some worry that someone would come in and try to break these markets with excess speculation. I think some of that still exists. Jim, you've worked on the air quality regulatory issues for a lot of years. And um, it would be an understatement to say things are rather heated uh, right now on the Hill. I think just uh, today, Senator Hatch introduced legislation in the Senate, which largely mimics legislation that uh, Representative Cantor introduced in the House, which would uh, basically stop EPA broad from advancing a number of regulations. I know that uh, in Texas there's a lot of controversy over a recent EPA rule on transport of pollution from one state to another. These things have always been kind of controversial, but not like this, not from the recent memory. And you know, I wonder if you can uh, reflect a little on what you think is going on there. Well, the Clean Air Act, you know, was, was uh, enacted when President uh, Nixon was in office. Um, every uh, in federal environmental law was bipartisan. And recently, I think for political reasons and ideological reasons, uh, most of the Republican Party has abandoned their history. Uh, I'm sad to say. Um, our board at EDF is bipartisan, and I can tell you our Republican members of the board are gnashing their teeth in crime because 
um, at least on this issue, their party has left them. Um, we got to figure out how to get back to bipartisan areas. Uh, I will tell you, uh, the rhetoric is unbelievable. Um, Governor Perry um, claimed one rule that or one ruling of the EPA would shut down the oil and gas industry, cut jobs. It was on something called flex permitting that only Texas did, which was 40 other, 49 other states permitted another way. Texas couldn't do it. Our, our industry would, would fail. EPA went ahead and forced the rule. Every company that had the illegal permits got the legal permits. Not one job was lost. Not one plant closed for a day. The same kind of claims are being made now. Uh, there's worry about that possibly 500 jobs might be lost in Texas because of the cross-state air pollution rule. That same rule, I don't think anybody doubts this, uh, the, the scientists say will save up to 1,700 lives a year in Texas. Um, our state officials worry about the loss of 500 possible jobs. Same state officials who passed policies that were laying off 49,000 teachers, 6,000 state employees. Some of us see this as not a real concern about jobs, but carrying water for political contributors. Uh, I know that sounds harsh, but it is, it really, from our point of view, it literally is about where the kids live or die. And we may not win this fight, but we're going to tell it like it is. And I think actually there are enough people in both parties to eventually prevail on that. I'm sorry, I didn't have a question against strong views on it. You want to give me another one? <laughs> Senator Oregon, Jim, in an uh, early response, mentioned, I think, that one of the constraining uh, forces of energy policy was just the incredible uh, challenge we have with the debt in the 14 trillion dollars we have uh, you know, borrowed and now need to pay back. Your reflections on the super committee, is energy going to be part of that conversation? And what do you just think more broadly, um, the debt means for energy policy? Well, if I really knew and advertised that I was going to say something that I knew about the super committee, this room would be packed in the reference. Nobody has the foggiest idea what they're doing. <laughs> the super committee is probably a super bad idea. Um, but. But the fact is, it's an outgrowth of a really shameful display in, in this town of responsible people saying what we ought to do is uh, default on our debt as a country. What we ought to do is decide that we will not pay our bills. That was really shameful, uh, but nonetheless, there were enough of them that said it, that the question was going to be, would the government continue to operate? Would the government actually default? And so emerging from this was an idea coupled with some cuts in spending, and the idea was we'll put a super committee together and put a super short timeline on them, I think it's November 23rd, for them to come up with $1.2 trillion in, uh, in cuts. Now, this, the, the consequences of failure are so much greater for this super committee than the consequences of success. The consequences of success will be a very small step in the right direction even if they get to the $1.2 trillion. We're talking in the next decade of somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to $14 trillion in debt. And this is, if you don't mind my going just a bit further to say, this, is, this should not be mysterious to any of us in this room, but people think this is a really complicated puzzle. It's not. We cut the revenue base in this country 10 years ago dramatically. I voted against it, warned against it, but we cut it. And then we went to war in two countries halfway around the world, didn't pay for one penny of it, then we gave a green light to Wall Street to say, do what you want to do, we won't watch. And they nearly took the country off a cliff, which increased the economic stabilizer costs of all these people that are unemployed and decreased the revenue base by about another $400 billion. That's why we're in this position. Now we've got to find a way out. Uh, now we've got to find a way out. And the, the super committee has to succeed somehow. My own estimate is that they will stagger across the finish line with some concocted gimmicky uh, scoring, scorekeeping so that at least it's said they accomplish something. But ultimately, these are hard choices. We need to, you know, we have to bring our troops home from Afghanistan now. That's where terrorists were, not where they are. And so there are a lot of things we should do, and the question is do we have the will and the courage as a country 
to support those who are willing to propose them. I hope so. Kirk, anything you're passionate about that I should uh, <laughs> Uh, no comments on the secret committee. I, I, I just, uh, in my own view, I have three young children. I hope uh, you know, we uh, have some, done something about it by the time uh, by the time they're older. But one, just one point about uh, energy policy is uh, I mentioned the, the Keystone XL pipeline, the pipeline from Canada, the post pipeline from Canada to the U.S. Yesterday, I got a call from a reporter at Rolling Stone who wanted to talk about this oil pipeline. I don't know when the last time Rolling Stone wrote an article about an oil pipeline. Uh, so look for it in the next issue. Uh, but what it signals to, to me is uh, you know, we don't have a coherent architecture regarding energy that will help investors make clear and firm decisions for, for many years to come. So I think both sides, whether you are pro the pipeline or anti the pipeline, it's, it's an issue that both have gravitated to in the absence of a, a broader policy framework. And the concern is, in the absence of a broader policy framework, we may see more battles on a case-by-case -case basis regarding oil and gas development, infrastructure development, in that absence, which probably isn't really helpful to, to either side. So um, everyone thinks that the purpose of the moderator is to ask a simple insightful questions. Um, the truth is that the only real obligation is to get you to your reception awake and on time. <laughs> so we have about 15 minutes. Um, I'd like to open it up to some questions. I have another dozen I can ask this panel. But um, anybody want to step to a mic? We'll wait. Go on. Please. I'm Ken First from the World Affairs Council of Western Massachusetts. I have a, a, a question regarding electrical grid. You mentioned that we are going, going to or need to um, upgrade it. We can do it in a way that's more effective or less effective. I think one of the vulnerabilities of the electric grid is from cyber warfare. And as we redo the uh, electrical grid, are we going to upgrade in such a way that we create a better defense? Or is that possible? Well, I hope so. The, uh, the DOE uh, had stimulus projects related to smart grid demonstration projects. And it required every project to have a cybersecurity component, uh, both as a condition for getting the money and they check along the way whether you're, you're actually fulfilling that to uh, get paid. So I hope, obviously, it's a big threat. Uh, actually, I think if you try, if you can make the grid more microgrids as opposed to everything being tied together, that's one of the, the possibilities that you can have a true smart grid and make us less vulnerable to some kind of wide scale attack by, by computers or even by terrorists. Martin Johnson from Corpus Christi, Texas. Could you say anything about the future of nuclear power? Well, I think it's uh, some of the highest cost electricity, but I do think there, it, it appears to me, uh, given some loan guarantees that were enacted in the 2005 uh, Energy Act, that there will be a couple of nuclear power plants built. Uh, the Senator Pete Domenici played a significant role in that, and I think there's going to be some, there has already been some movement, there will probably be a couple plants built, I don't think, because of the cost per kilowatt hour of constructing a nuclear energy plant, and also the Japanese experience with a significant setback, I don't think we're going to see a substantial number of new nuclear plants built in the United States. One thing that wasn't mentioned in the, the discussion with uh, Doug Boshi is that natural gas prices coming down is really wonderful, unless you're trying to build renewables or a nuclear power plant. So what, what really has put, uh, I think, a, a hold on nuclear power is that they needed about $8 gas and a $20 carbon fee to be, to pencil out. And now they're looking at 4 or $5 gas and no carbon fee. So it's, it's really just an economic issue. Hi, uh, yes. I'm Christopher Gachakis. I'm a student at St. John's College. Um, I have a question that's based on a couple of key events and, and facts that seem to have come up from the last two, um, from this panel and from the discussion beforehand. Um, the first is that the growth in energy consumption in America is mainly being driven in the electricity sector. Um, the second um, 
is simply that we have finite resources on this finite planet. I'm rather surprised that we haven't heard more about removal development and how that not only could factor into the equation on a federal policy level, but also in terms of private cooperation. Um, from my perspective, which in terms of the particulars of energy isn't particularly educated, it seems very clear that it would be more advantageous to pursue renewable sources as opposed to natural gas, oil, any other fossil fuel, because even if we do find cost-effective ways of extracting these resources, even if we can mitigate environmental impacts, it seems clear that we're going to run out. And whether that's 10 years or 100 years from now, how are we going to start planning for what seems to be a necessary transition into other energy sources? Question. Jim, go ahead. Take a shot. Well, we think of natural gas as what comes after coal. And we hope it happens soon, but only if we produce natural gas correctly. Um, but we need to be thinking what comes after natural gas. And renewables are a big part of that. Uh, one reason why I talk about smart grid is to really integrate large amounts of intermittent renewables like sun, solar, or wind power, you need a smarter grid so you can match up the low growth to when those resources are available and that you can also turn off non-essential uses of electricity when clouds go over your solar panel. So we actually believe right now there's some limitation 20, 30 percent, it's probably maybe 35 percent is the maximum amount of solar and wind you can integrate to a system. A smart system, uh, Ireland has a goal of getting 60 percent of their power from renewables through smart grid. I think we can even do better than that. But without the technology to actually predict when the wind's going to blow and to turn things off and shift load, you can't ever get to the number that you need to get the kind of clean air we need. Just one comment about renewable, and we tend to think of renewables, lump everything together, and it sounds wonderful. The biggest source of renewable energy in the United States, the way the U.S. government categorizes it, if you ask the Nebraska farmer, they'll agree on this, is ethanol. Ethanol, by far, is the biggest renewable fuel in the United States. Now, that probably doesn't strike everyone as a, as a green fuel, made for some, you know, it's controversial. Uh, wind power can compete very well in some niche markets. It can play a role. It's probably not going to be a base load, but it can certainly play a role. Solar has uh, some other issues. So when we talk about renewable, it just, it's useful to kind of break it down. What exactly are we talking about? Biofuels, wind power, which can compete, or solar, which still has a you know, it, it, is, it has been the case for a long time that that the the mantra unspoken is that real men dig and drill. <laughs> so if you're not drilling and digging as a part of the energy policy, somehow you might wear a corduroy sport coat with a leather patch and smoke a pipe and drink Chardonnay. And God bless you. Just don't get in our way. <laughs> you know, you like renewables, good for you. But don't but stay out of our way because it'll never amount to anything. That, that's, that's sort of been the mantra. I believe very strongly that we ought to have a renewable electricity standard of 20%, which I pushed for very hard. We ought to have a 20% national renewable standard to drive renewables because it's in our national interest to do so. There's this old saying, if you don't care where you're going, you're never going to be lost. So we're never going to be lost in energy policy unless we as a country decide, here's the destination we're aiming toward. That, that's why I get back to what I said at the very first. We need national energy policy to, to, to hitch up this nation of ours as a team and drive towards a conclusion that we know represents the national interest. And that includes renewables in a very significant way. I'm going to let for a second. Uh, Sky Forster in Colorado Springs and formerly in Pittsburgh. And one of the things that in both of those states, this is a two part question, um, in, in I can hardly turn on the television without getting reminded of this as well, that somehow coal is turned from black to green. And you see that on the Pennsylvania Turnpike all the time. So my first question is, what is our progress in rendering coal a much cleaner source of energy? And a related, set, related piece to that is that 
Europe, but even most of all, the Chinese, are not going to go away from coal anytime soon. I don't suspect we shall either for a lot of political and economic reasons. But somehow it's, we seem to have an aversion of dealing with our global, our global energy, pro our, our energy problem in a global context. For example, ideas that have been posted about collaboration with China and really investing substantial amounts of money in a collaborative way to find cleaner ways to do coal, which will help us all, it's not just the, 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 the polluted cities in China. But secondly, our insistence on taxing things like Brazilian sugarcane-based ethanol, um, because we'd rather do it with corn-based ethanol produced in this country. So there's a global dimension to this that seems to be missing as well. Let's start on coal. The, the global perspective makes coal it's very difficult to deal with. If you look at the last uh, Chinese five-year plan uh, on energy, the first three points was, one, we're going to maximize use of domestic resources. Two, we're going to increase energy efficiency. Three, in case you didn't get the first point about using domestic resources, the third point was coal is the base fuel. And about 80% of China's electric power comes from coal. About 70% of India's electric power comes from uh, coal as well. So coal is going to be around for a long time, certainly in the emerging markets. Uh, there are efforts being made to burn it more efficiently. Uh, but coal is coal. It's never going to become solar. And it's going to be a big source of energy uh, and energy supply in emerging markets. Well, let me uh, say that there's no such thing as clean coal. There is cleaner coal than dirty coal. <laughs> uh, I would encourage everybody to, to look at the back page of Scientific America, their most recent special issue on energy, and look at the number of deaths that are attributed to coal mining. Um, there are a lot of miners killed every year in this country and all over the world. We, and one of the things we've done with coal in a lot of um, our economy is violate Adam Smith 101, which is all the cost of production are supposed to be the cost of the product. We have externalized the health cost for kids and the mining deaths. And the taxpayers subsidize the, all the black lung disease uh, victims. So we got to figure out some way to at least even out the subsidies a little bit. There's always this complaint that we subsidize wind 1. Point, so 1.2, 1.8 cents a, a megawatt uh, hour, uh, kilowatt hour. Compared to the subsidies of coal, it's nothing. They're indirect. So we got to figure out how to get that right. But I do think you're right, we're not going to let coal immediately. We got to figure out ways to get it cleaner. We started down that path. We actually had money in there that was going to come about if we passed climate legislation. Uh, and frankly, the Chinese were wait, waiting for us to develop carbon capture storage or other technology. They, they want us to do it, but they want us to do it first. That's actually the technology we sell the Chinese. We go forward. And I, I, it, it's kind of too bad that after climate legislation failed, then the, the companies didn't think they had to invest in it, and then we had the, the crisis of no, no federal funds for these kind of projects, or next to none. I think we still got to solve that problem and do it pretty quickly. Let's see, what about the uh, platforms? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to China tomorrow, by the way, and the last two days there have been air quality warnings in Beijing, so um, I'll get a chance to smell all that coal, I suppose. Um, let me just say about coal, it's one of our most abundant resources. And the question is, could it be used in a way that doesn't injure the environment? I could tell, we don't have time, but I could tell you three or four things going on in the country in research that are really interesting to me. The world's most foremost authority on concrete. He's patented a process, I held a hearing and asked him to commit, uh, beneficial uses of CO2, for example. But this guy's patented a process in which he takes all of the effluent from a, a coal-fired plant, he mineralizes it through a chemical process, turns it into a product that is harder and more valuable than concrete, that encapsulates all the CO2. He doesn't separate anything. He just takes everything that's coming out of the plant and through his patented process, turns it into a product that has value that contains all the CO2, which would bring the cost of carbon, if that scales, to near zero. 
Well, maybe, maybe this guy's got the answer. I don't know. But I can tell you three or four other, other ideas that are just as interesting to me. Craig Venter is working on uh, putting synthetic microbes underground and shoot through the coal seam. And in situ, the coal seam is gone, but there's fuel in its way. It's all done underground. And, you know, I, there's a, I, I wouldn't give up on coal. I wouldn't go burn a bunch tonight in your house. But, I would, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't give up on coal as a resource because had we passed climate change legislation in the Congress, there would have been a price on carbon, which I think is essential. It has to be a price on carbon. The money achieved from that, in part, would have been used for the massive research that needs to be funded in order to unlock the use of coal in a way that doesn't despoil our environment. We have our two final questions. Thank you. I'm Matt Allendorf from the World Affairs Council in Washington, D.C. I heard some discussion this afternoon about increasing energy efficiency, but virtually none about actually reducing consumption. And I wonder if members of the panel could compare per capita energy consumption in this country with other industrial countries and talk about possibilities for reducing consumption. Thank you. So we all know it's a lot higher. Who's got the, uh, the highest tax? I don't, let me just say, we, we are prodigious wasters of energy. We use more per capita than anybody in the world. And uh, the efficiency issue is, uh, McKinsey says, it's the lowest hanging fruit by far of anything dealing with energy. And I was chairman of the, when I was in the Senate, I was also chairman of the uh, Alliance to Save Energy, a really significant organization. And we've worked a lot on efficiency and conservation. Both of them have to be front and center on any energy policy. Or you're asking a question that anybody who's doing advocacy or in the political world didn't want to talk about very much. You know, the size of our houses are so much bigger than they were even in the 1960s. Um, at some point, we probably have to ask ourselves, is that a good policy or not? Uh, but it's hard to tell Americans to have smaller houses. I think, uh, frankly, the kids behind us uh, have figured out that you're happier if you spend money on experiences than on things. There's actually studies that show that, and I think they're going to figure it out. They're going to live very different lives than the baby boomers live in terms of what they put the money in and how they live their lives, what their cities will look like, what their house will look like. I, I actually hope for this because I think they think about things differently and what is important and, and what shows you're successful. One point about energy consumption at the global level, uh, very quickly. Uh, recently I went back to the village I was in the Peace Corps in West Africa, Nigeria. I was there about 22 years ago. Part of the energy, energy consumption. You go back now, there's some generators there that have more modern forms of energy consumption and their living standards have arrived. It has some prosperity. So the rise in global energy consumption it certainly has its impacts. I don't want to minimize that. The rise in global energy consumption is a reflection of the tremendous global prosperity that we've seen emerge over the last uh, couple of decades. I have a question. Uh, Bruce Hollaback from Orange County, California chapter. You mentioned that the largest renewable source of energy we had in this country was uh, ethanol. Uh, producing ethanol creates more problems in the air than it solves in the gas tank. And in the process of our government subsidizing it, we caused a huge increase in the cost of corn, which increased meat production costs and increased food costs all over the world in a very harmful manner. Seems to me that, uh, do you think there's a chance back in Congress that they will eliminate that subsidy so that we can use some common sense in uh, doing our energy instead of creating problems and increasing our government costs all the time? Who wants Good Well, you're not in office anymore, so I decide what you think. You know, I'm from North Dakota. And, uh, you know, who, who would have thought when our country said, you know what, let's produce, let's, let's replace 10% of renewable oil with domestically produced ethanol. People said, well, that can't be done. That won't be done. It won't work. It did work much more quickly than anybody expected. And I know there are competing studies out there, and I've looked at all of those studies. I think the production of ethanol has been a net positive in this country. 
we will now move to cellulosic ethanol, away from corn ethanol. And uh, I think we ought to continue to do that in a responsible way. I think it's good for the country, frankly. The only point I'll add is that Congress actually decided to let that subsidy expire, which is really the first beginning, leading edge of what I think the debt is going to do to our, our energy policy. So ethanol will not have to compete on its uh, merits, and we will see how that goes. Well, thank you all very much for the for our panel.